you done now? As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. Doc, are you telling me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time at the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I am your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. Welcome back to the show, guys. I hope you have had a great time. Today on the show, I welcome a friend of mine, Jack, from Theme Park History. On this episode of the show, we talk about theme parks in general but we spend a good deal of time talking about Back to the Future, the ride, which Jack, who is a theme park expert, mainly a Universal Studios theme park expert, Jack says that the Back to the Future, the ride, is the greatest theme park ride of all time. In the history of all theme park rides, this one, Back to the Future, is the best one. So I'm gonna share with you our entire conversation about Back to the Future, the ride, and theme parks in general. I think if you're a fan of Back to the Future, you're going to be a fan of this conversation overall. So enjoy. This is Jack from Theme Park History. We talk Back to the Future of the Ride as well as Disney and Universal Studios. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Brad Gilmore Show. we got a special guest joining me right now. He is the host of the popular YouTube channel Theme Park History. His name is... Jack, Jack, how you doing, man? I'm all right, Brad. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm, that's the first time somebody has actually done that intro for me, so I have a big smile on my face right now. <laughs> well, you know, uh, this is your is this this your first podcast interview, right? It, it actually is, yeah. So I'm I, to be honest, I am a little bit nervous about it, but you know, got to got to jump in the water sometime. Well, you know, maybe just make sure that nervous energy just you know have them all line up, all the butterflies line up and fly straight. Um, but let's let's talk here for a second about your channel. Um, it's really incredible what you've done. There's so many YouTube channels out there, so much content being created on a daily basis, an hourly basis, really. Um, your channel is less than nine months old and already has over half a million views. That's a pretty incredible run to start a YouTube channel in January and already have such great numbers. Let's go through just kind of the process. What what made you want to start the channel Theme Park History? Well, it actually stemmed from getting a gift last Christmas. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of Universal Studios theme parks, specifically Universal Studios Florida. I've been going there since 93 when I was four years old. So as a gift, I received a pamphlet from Universal Studios Florida from my sister. It's a 1989 version of it. So this is actually before the park even opened. So I was looking at it, and you're seeing all the artwork for the old attractions, so Confrontation, Jaws, Back to the Future. And I remember the rides. But I was more curious about what actually went through to create the attractions and why did the attractions close. So when I started to go on YouTube and check online, there's never ever like videos dedicated to Universal itself. So I decided, since I really am a big fan of the park, that maybe somebody should actually make those videos to actually cover the history, break down what went into the ride and why the ride was actually created. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's been an amazing nine months and I never imagined at all that I would be where I am right now. Well, you know, it, it's funny because we have kind of a similar story. When I started the, uh, you know, I host the Back to the Future podcast, I started that because I wanted, you know, I love podcasting. Obviously, I got several, uh, too many to keep up with. But uh, I was like, man, I'd love to see if there's a Back to the Future show out there. So, you know, after some, some searching, I found none. So I said, well, hell, might as well start one myself. Um, and, and I love that, too. You know, your channel is so... 
you know, so I kind of fell back into the theme parks, um, the love for them, the love for the rides and the lore. Um, probably about two years ago, my girlfriend and I went to LA and I was like, you know what? I've been to Disney world several times as a kid. I've never been to Disneyland. Would love to go to Disneyland. And then of course I go, I relive my childhood, have an incredible time. And, uh, and then I kind of get all back into the, the swing of things. And, and I've started to research kind of like you, like, oh man, I want to know the history of Pirates of the Caribbean. I want to know about, you know, uh, whatever else. It's a small world or Splash Mountain or Space Mountain, whatever it is. So I just kind of started doing a deep dive. And when I'm working on the Back to the Future podcast, I was like, oh man, I need to know more about Back to the Future, the ride. Because I have, and you're going to hate me for this, Jack. I've never been to a Universal Park. Not one uh, time. Not one uh. time. And uh, one of one of the great regrets of my life, there aren't many, but one of them is not being able to experience Back to the Future, the ride. So I start to try to do some research, and that's where I found your channel, and I hit the subscribe button because the <laughs> the amount of detail, though, that, that you go into in the videos are, are incredible. You know, there was a couple channels that I found, and yours being, you know, the one that I kind of gravitated to the most because um, I'm sure you're familiar with this channel. There's a channel called Defunct Land. I don't, I don't know yes. if you've seen them. They do great stuff, too. I think the guy's name is Kevin. Kevin uh, yeah, Perger. Kevin, yeah, Kevin Perger. He is, I want to say, when you talk about those type of videos and those type, like, theme park history, usually the first name that pops up is the Funk Land and Kevin Perger. I think he just recently had over 300,000 subscribers. Again, he makes great content. And you can just see what this year, his second season, his production qualities are insane. And again, I'm a huge fan of his stuff. And he just does, like myself, a lot of research, a lot of detail. And it's just, he covers stuff that I never even imagined to cover. Like he recently just did something about Club Disney, something that I never <laughs> even knew existed. Right. And again, he, it's just something where there was only five locations. It's kind of like a Chuck E. Cheese. I'm going, when did Disney ever do this? And then, you know, that's what I like about him. He picks out stuff that you wouldn't exactly think would actually you know be worth a video and then once you watch it and you hear all this information go wow that's really interesting stuff and that's what i love about both of y'all's channels and and and, and yours what I, what I like about yours it different from defunct land obviously it covers rides that are still in existence uh and and, and covers you know more of a you know, not not why did this ride go wrong? You know, more of just a, a general history of, about it. You know, the, the Defunct Land series is great, though. I mean, I, I encourage everyone if you're a fan of theme parks, you're obviously that's why you're listening to this to go check out his channel too, because uh, it is great. But you know, and, and one of the things that he did, which I did love, because um, I'm a Houstonian, he covered Astro World. Um, he did a, a nice yeah. little uh, documentary style video about Astro World, which you know is a childhood favorite of mine. I, I might not have <laughs> been, ever been to Universal, but I, I, I visited Astro World quite one too many times, and uh, it, it's no Disneyland, but it was it was definitely an incredible yeah. place, incredible it, place for me. Have you done anything on Astro World on your channel? I don't think so. No, right now we're specifically focusing on just theme park rides and shows. We are eventually going to try to branch out a bit. It's been highly requested, so I'm probably going to give in to what the fans want. And in October, we're probably going to cover Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights to some extent. And then once we actually get most of the fan requests out of the way, one of my goals is to actually cover the history of theme parks themselves. Uh, but those videos are probably going to be a little bit more ambitious, a little bit longer than what we do right now. And again, that's going to require a lot more research. So... Figure we start off with the rides, see where the fan requests go, and once we knock out a lot of that, then we can actually go exploring and try to broaden the horizons of the channel itself. So let's talk about Universal Studios for a minute. You know, I've never been there, but I have a, I have a beef with Universal Studios, and I'll tell you why. And it really, mm -hmm. I never understood it until I started watching uh, the videos in your channel and realizing that. Um, you, you did one about the the Mummy Returns ride, the the the, yes. the first psychological thriller oh, slash right, yeah. you know dark. It's still a dark ride, and and I guess for people who don't know, dark ride is kind of like how would you describe a dark ride? You know, Pirates of the Caribbean's a dark ride. What would be the the characteristics of a dark ride? Well, the basic definition I would give somebody so they just completely understand is a dark ride usually takes place inside a building, a soundstage, somewhat in the case of Universal Studios where basically you're in a ride vehicle that's enclosed. It's not actually outside, and usually most of the time, like a dark ride is, 
the rooms aren't very lit, everything stays dark. That way it can just hide what's going on around you. You don't see the actual ride track, you don't see some of the animatronics, you don't see the walls and the roof of the building itself. Yeah, okay. So that's 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 kind of what I figured. I, I wasn't sure if there was any other like super like, you know, detailed definition of it no. that you know that, that you know separated it but you know the mummy ride it looks awesome right i've never been obviously but it looks like a great ride um it, it's incredible but you had to shut down a beloved attraction in order to open this ride and that seems to be something about universal studios that they they hold no ride you know no no ride is exempt Nothing is held sacred. They're, they, they'll tear anything up. I mean, we talk about the E.T. ride, gone. Confrontation, gone. Jaws, gone. Back to the future, damn it. <laughs> gone. Replaced with the Simpsons, of all things. Uh, what, 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 how do you feel about Universal? It's your, you love the park more than any other ones. You said you're, you're a Universal guy. How do you feel about, you know, essentially your home team having no love for the stars that made them? As a fan of the park, it does disappoint me. Um, you know, I really, all the rides that I grew up with in the 90s, except one, which is the E.T. Adventure at Florida's Park, they're all gone, like you said. And they've been replaced with attractions that many people feel are not worth the successors. So the Simpsons ride is the best example. I don't think it's a worthy successor to what Back to the Future was. But from a business standpoint, it makes sense. Universal knows that they can't compete with Disney with the old attractions that they have. So their plan has always been, how are we going to draw people in? I know. Let's start bringing in all these movies and these franchises that are very popular with people right now. And then eventually when they don't become popular anymore, we'll just wipe the floor with it. From a fan standpoint... I hate the idea, but I understand if they kept rides from that were based on movies from, let's say, the 70s and 80s, I don't know how many younger generations are going to care to come to the park for something they've never even seen where they haven't even heard. I know, but at the same time, you know, okay, here's a great example. I think one of my favorite rides at Disney, Splash Mountain, right? Splash Mountain is based on the characters from the Song of the South, a controversial film released, I think, in the 50s or something like that by Disney. Um, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, these are characters that I think that even as a, as a kid going to Disney World, I had never heard of. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of this property at all. I wasn't aware of this IP. Um, but you don't see Disney just, you know, getting rid of uh, Splash Mountain because people don't know the characters or revamping it and making it I don't know, whatever mountain, you know, Cars Mountain or what have you. Or <laughs> I know, I know they just did the re, uh, the revamp of the Tower of Terror ride, which not a lot of people are happy about. But Disney, that's kind of a few and far between type thing, at least in my opinion, uh, or at least from my research. So why Universal say, I don't know. I mean, just like Back to the Future, a, a lot of people regard that as one of the best theme park rides of all time. And I, I think if you get a classic like that, I don't know why you'd want to move away from it just because, and especially back, what, three years ago, Back to the Future was, again, the biggest thing in the world. That is true, obviously, for, what, the 30th anniversary, 2015, was yeah. a big deal. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you on that. And to say what the difference between Disney's rides and Universal's rides are, I tend to hear it more from Disney fans that the rides are considered classics, that they're something that they're timeless, they're fun experiences. And I, I kind of say it can go the same way for Universal. I also want to say that Disney can get away with it because for most of their parks, they have the extra space to actually build new attractions while keeping the old ones intact. Universal in both of their parks, they don't really have much real estate anymore, especially like for Universal Studios Florida and Islands of Adventure. The recent years when they built Diagon Alley and they built Skull Island Reign of Kong, they're actually going to where they used to have employee entrances and places like that. So I kind of feel that it's a decision that if they could keep back to the future, they would have. But they realize that they don't have the real estate space to do so. And I and I can understand that, you know, I mean they're that definitely Universal has always kind of been second to Disney as far as getting to the location and establishing themselves as the the dominant in that 
field, right? I mean, in Orlando, obviously, when people say yeah, a theme course. park Orlando, you think Disney World. If you think theme park LA, you think Disneyland. And obviously, they were there first on 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 both of them. Um, what do you think, though? If you had to say, once again, as a Universal guy, I'm more of a Disney guy, but as a Universal guy, if you had to say, like, you know, what would be Universal's biggest difference from Disney? I would say it's always been who they're targeting. Uh, It's really been more of their rides being focused on young adults and teenagers kind of being thrill rides especially when Universal Studios Florida opened up in the 90s. You can see the difference in a ride like Confrontation and Jaws and Back to the Future versus, like you mentioned, it's a small world where Peter Pan's flight. I don't think an 18-year-old, and again, this is my opinion, they don't mind going on Peter Pan's flight, but somebody like myself, who was like 13 or 14, I was more excited to go on something like Back to the Future because I watched that movie. I knew what that movie was. And I was really excited to experience something from it. But it's always been the case where you've seen them kind of target more of that young audience, the young adult audience, I should say. That's changed, though, because they've obviously put in Harry Potter, which kind of appeals to all age groups and things like Minions as well, which is more focused towards kids. Yeah, well, but at the same time. You don't think that um, – because the thing about Disney is even the rides that I think are – I don't know. The ones that are more geared to, ch- to children are still loved by adults because those adults rode those rides. So I guess it's just Disney has that long run, right, of these classic attractions, be it Haunted House, Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mountain, Splash Mountain. It's a small world. These are staples, I guess, in theme park history, uh, and they've had a long time to – I don't know, make themselves uh, known to the general public as opposed to Universal that's had a shorter run as far as the history of the parks goes. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. That's I guess that's the best point where, you know, somebody who rode Pirates of the Caribbean as a 10 year old and then goes back 20 years later with a kid, they're going to obviously take them to Disney because their memories of that ride, you know, are, are fun and exciting. They had a good time as a kid. So let me take my kids there. For Universal Studios, the IPs and the movies that they use, for the most part, you know, I love Back to the Future, and I think the franchise is great. I love Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park and Back to the Future, their appeal could be the children, but usually it's always been to me like, you know, teenagers and everything else like that, you know, older adults. It wasn't until like a couple of years ago when Back to the Future, the 30th anniversary, like you mentioned. I started to see younger people starting to care about it, but only care about it because, hey, it's the 30th anniversary of something. And the only reason most of the people I was kind of seeing paying attention was because of the release of those Nike shoes, the automatic laces. Right. People like, oh, wow, (laughs) Nike made these shoes all of a sudden. What movie is that from? Uh, I'm going to go check that out. Right, right. So, and, you know, Jurassic Park, I saw it as a kid. I saw it when it was re released for the 20th anniversary a couple of years ago. And that was the first time I saw parents going to the movie theater, taking their five and six year old kids. So, you know, it's this thing where Disney, the, 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 the movies, the rides, the shows, the characters, you could show them the five or six year old kids because that's the appeal of Mickey Mouse. You try showing a six year old like, you know, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, they'll probably start crying. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's all. Yeah. It, and again, I'll take my kids on the T-Rex. And on Jurassic Park, and they'll be fine. But I know how it is with some parents. They go, well, you know, my kid's watching television. I'd rather have them watch Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy, than, you know, Velociraptors and Biff Tannen and everything else. So, And I, and I get it. I get it. I think, I think it's just kind of what, what, what your preference is more than anything. But when you talk about Back to the Future, the ride, let's talk about it just here for a minute. Um, I never got to ride it. I've, I've watched several videos of ride films and footage and, and what have you. Walk me through the experience as a Back to the Future fan. You're a fan of the films, you said. Getting on the Back to the Future ride. Walk me through the quote. Walk me through it all. Like, wh- How was that as an experience? The experience at the time was something that hadn't really been done when it first opened up. Um, for those who don't know it, 
it's considered a simulator ride. So basically you're in a ride vehicle with a giant screen in front of you and whatever is happening on the screen, your ride vehicle is mimicking. Uh, for me, it's one of the best experiences I've had on a universal ride because of the way it's presented and the way you're actually in the ride vehicle. So the best example that it is compared to Back to the Future back in the day was Star Tours, the original version. But a lot of people prefer Back to the Future because instead of a small screen in front of you for Star Tours, you're in a massive IMAX dome that's 80 feet tall. So you're immersed in this universe and watching the film and everything taking place. In Star Tours, you're in a 40-passenger vehicle. kind of doesn't feel very personal. In Back to the Future, you're in a eight-passenger DMC-12 DeLorean convertible. It, you're, in the ro- you're in the vehicle that everybody wanted when the movie came out. It's a pretty cool experience. And while I've enjoyed the ride as a kid and as an adult, it's always been an experience for me to just be able to you know, hang out with Doc Brown, stop Biff Tannen, go back in time, go to the 2015, come back to the Cretaceous period. I always thought it was a really fun experience. And as a and as a movie fan, it seems to be all the theme like it was a thought out experience, right? I mean, they thought about it and they were trying to figure out what is the best way if Back to the Future did continue on. Doc Brown returns on the the Vernian Express essentially, and and if the story were con- were to continue, this is how it would continue. And that's kind of what I've always liked about uh, themed rides that are after film properties is when they instead of just a retelling of the story, which a lot of, you know, and, and I think Disney is is, is pretty much, they, they do a lot of that in their parts, especially with their, you know, iconic animated features, whether it be Peter Pan or Snow White or whatever. It's more of a retelling of the movie than a continuation. And I think that's what was so good about the Back to the Future ride, or at least what I can tell from people, is that it was a continuation of the story. So it was something that, even if you had seen the film a million times, like someone like I had, you have not experienced this particular story. And and that seemed to be what a large appeal was about it. Would, would, would I be correct on that? Yeah, you're correct. Um, most, most fans will say it's kind of a mini sequel to the original trilogy. It, it's not canon in the universe. It's not like you need to know what happens in, in the ride to actually experience the entire movie series. But it's a, it's a nice story. If you really like the three movies, why not check out the ride? Because it has characters you relate to. It has a story similar to those three. And basically, you become the hero instead of Marty McFly. And I always thought that was pretty cool. And like you've mentioned, most of Universal's attractions are that same way, where it's like it takes from the movie, but it's not a retelling of the movie itself. It incorporates stuff from the movies that you remember. Jurassic Park River Adventure, it's something that was cut from the movie itself, but it's the same type of idea where you're on a boat trip, you're inside the park, it's fully functional, and just like the movie, everything goes wrong. Nothing goes according to plan. In case of Back to the Future, Doc Brown wants you to help him with an experiment, you travel through time, and you deal with Biff Tannen. Yeah, I mean, it's just exactly what you want, but you bring up Jurassic Park, and I, and I wanted to talk to you about this ride, too, because the Jurassic Park ride seems like, at least from what I've learned about it, what I've watched as far as ride footage, seems to probably be uh, one of the favorites at U- the Universal Studios Park. So that, that river adventure looks incredible. I mean, the theming looks so good. The animatronics are good, especially with the uh, the dinosaurs that spit the venom out at you, and it and it looks right. you know you know kind of real. And the the big drop, the Tyrannosaurus, everything looks great about that ride. But it seems to be another ride that they're going to shut down for retheming for to to appeal to the Jurassic World uh, franchise. How do you feel about that? Being a Universal guy once again, they're revamping another one of the classics. I. When the news came out, I despised it because I think Jurassic, just like Back to the Future, Jurassic Park is a classic attraction you shouldn't change. Right. But compared to when it first opened in 1996 to its current state now, it's hurting. Most of the animatronics don't work. They're not fully functional. The ride needs a lot of TLC. And unfortunately, if this is going to be the way it gets it, I guess it has to be. But that's for Universal Studios Hollywood. There's been a lot of rumors about 
what happens to the one at Islands of Adventure, the one in Universal Studios Japan, the one in Universal Studios Singapore. And the rumors state that eventually all of them might actually change over to Jurassic World because the contract that Universal Studios and Michael Crichton had is that they have the rights to the naming of Jurassic Park up until a sixth movie. Afterwards, all the naming rights to Jurassic Park go back to the Michael Crichton estate. So it's in limbo right now. A lot of people feel that once this next movie comes out, you're going to see a lot of change because Universal won't be able to keep in its parks the name Jurassic Park. I don't know if they can come to an agreement to not change the rights and keep paying Michael Crichton's estate to actually keep using the name. But from what most people have told me, that might not be the case by the time I think 2021 is when the next Jurassic World movie comes out, that we might actually see all the rides change over. You know, you, you just kind of hinted to the fact that you might have some sources. Have, have you uh, kind of become a, a member of the community with this channel, with the theme park history? Have you now, have, do you have your insider information that you can get? Is that something that you've kind of uh, gained throughout this process? Uh, well, I won't say I know anybody in particular. I've always been part of the forums around theme parks, especially the ones in Universal. But also the information I just point out to you is people actually were telling me that in the YouTube comments. Like, hey, you know, I know the ride is closing down because it needs to revamp and it's part of Universal's plan. But also all the rides might change eventually. And people are sending me links to the articles. And so I think that's one of the benefits, too, of doing all this is that sometimes – I can have a conversation with somebody in the YouTube comments and they'll tell me something that I didn't even realize was actually happening or something that just came out. And you're like, well, by the time we released the video, obviously new information might have popped out. We obviously can't include it. The power of the people, Jack, the power of the people right there. Now, for me, my favorite ride I've always said was the Haunted Mansion at Disney. When I was a kid, that's what I always said. During my most recent visit to Disneyland, I think I've changed my opinion, and now it's Pirates of the Caribbean. But I think that the thing that they have in common, aside from being dark rides, I think that the theming is so great. When you're when you're walking up to the to the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland, you see all the tombstones. You walk through the actual mansion. There's the hall, you know, there's the, the dome that you're in where the pictures elongate and you know there's so much great theming and the pirates it's the same thing what in your opinion makes a great ride i think a great ride boils down to how it gets you immersed into the actual attraction into the actual ex into your experience there are rides where you basically just wait online you go on and that's it but like you mentioned, the Haunted Mansion, the moment you walk up on it and you see the mansion and its environment, it puts you into a mood. You know, it, it can creep you out. You can get excited for it while you're going through the queue. Like you mentioned, all those effects taking place. And then when you get to the ride itself, if it can immerse you in what it's trying to do, I think that what makes a great ride. Disney's always been known for that. They obviously go above and beyond, whether, whether it's their classics where things they just opened up like Toy Story Land, where you feel like you're obviously in Andy's playroom and everything else like that. That's what I've always really liked about Universal. You're waiting online, and they're trying to tell you a story. Revenge of the Mummy, you're on set for a brand new movie, and all of a sudden, things are going bad. The curse is real. Jurassic Park, you're on the island. You're about to visit the park. You're doing everything according to plan. It's a perfect boat ride. Things go bad confrontation uh, we're in the city here comes kong we're gonna evacuate you and then all of a sudden you're dealing with him twice so to me if the ride can tell a story and get you you know have you in feel immersed in that experience then i think it's a very great ride what ride to you though has had you know disney disney world all the disney's across the you know globe the uh, all the universal attractions even king's island astral world all of them that you've done your research on what ride has the best theming overall if you had to give that gold medal i know it's a tough question Ugh. but if you had to give that gold medal to one ride what ride is just completely immersive the theming from the moment that you walk up to the quo all the way throughout even into the gift shop what has the best theming that is like that's the toughest question a, i've been asked in a long time if you're gonna one. say if you're gonna say which one gets you in it 
I think right now it's Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey because you walk right up on Hogwarts. You're in Hogwarts. You're meeting Harry, Ron, and Hermione. You're seeing the places they're in. You get on the ride and you're part of the action. And when you get out, you're right back into the gift shop where they're selling you wands, books. To me, that's probably the most immersive experience I've had at a theme park because it just, you feel like you're there. And it's just the level of detail and the things that are in that area. You just feel like I'm actually here. The things I saw in the movies, the things I read in the books, I feel like I'm actually part of, you know, what I, I grew up with. And I and I've heard so many great things about Harry Potter, Di- you know, the Diagon Alley, the whole nine. Is that one of the mo- like just overall the Harry Potter land at both parks, Universal, Hollywood, and Orlando? Um, I just I've heard that it's probably the most incredible. They 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 pull off some of the most incredible you know imagery, the 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 trickery, the illusions that are available throughout the entire land, or just next level attractions. Would you say that that's probably I don't know. Is that going to go down in Universal history? Is that like the best thing that they've produced in the past, I don't know, decade or more? I would say yes, because of the actual area that they've been working on. Um, they, they are able to do this where they make Diagon Alley feel like you're actually in Diagon Alley and you can't see the rest of the park. So you're actually basically feeling like you're there, like you're actually part of the movie. Same thing with Hogwarts. And hogs meet. You're in the area. It's very hard to see, you know, Jurassic Park to your right, or to see the Lost Continent in front of you. So you're looking all around. And it's like, okay, it feels like I'm actually here, and that I don't want to leave. As far as it, will it be the best theming they do? Probably, but once Super Nintendo Land opens up, I don't know if maybe they're going to get the actual uh, the award for that. And what what right now is planned? Because that's one of the most interesting things I think Universal has done in a while. Let me obviously they had access to the Harry Potter films um, and, and getting that you know license for their theme parks, but getting Nintendo that it opens up, I think so many impossi- uh, so many po- probabilities and possibilities with the theming that you can do, the rides that you can do, the interactive rides, the attractions. How big of a get is that for Universal? That's probably the biggest they've gotten since Potter. Um, as far as how big it will be, I don't want to say it'll be more popular than Potter, but I think Nintendo, everybody knows who Mario is. I think it's just a draw in general. And I know it doesn't really fit into the theme of Universal Studios because they've been focusing on movies, but they've gotten to a point where I guess they feel like, eh, whatever we can get into the park that's popular, even if it's not a movie franchise, we'll take it. And to be honest, I think it's been something a lot of fans for Nintendo have been waiting for a long time because they've never really had a proper theme park or a proper ride dedicated to any Nintendo character. So to get an entire land dedicated to Mario and all those characters, it's, it's, to, to me, if you told me that when I was four or five years old, I would have never believed you because I never thought it would be possible. So you know, 20, 25 years later, you can have a ride basically about anything now, it seems. Yeah, right. And and I, I'm sure a lot of Nintendo fans were hoping, you know, with the announcement when, when they heard rumors about a Super Mario Brothers ride at Universal Studios, you know, Universal Studios always theming around movies. They were hoping it wasn't the Bob Hoskins 1990 Super Mario <laughs> Brothers film. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. They were ho- they were like, oh, hopefully we don't get something like that, and we actually get something that we see now. But well, you know, it's always been like that is something that I never imagined would happen. And even now, they're still just in their early stages, especially at Hollywood and Florida, about actually building it. Uh, I know Japan, they've been doing construction now for a while. That's probably going to be the first one that opens up. They're trying to get it open up, I believe, by 2020 when they're going to have, I believe, the Olympics there. So while they're going to have a lot of tourism, obviously it makes sense to, hey, let's get Nintendo Land open so we can draw some of those people into the park. Yeah, no, that I mean, obviously that makes sense, you know. I, it's kind of now a battle, as it always is, between Universal and Disney. You know, Star Wars Land, of course, opening up. I know a lot of fans are, are excited about that. Now you have Ninten- Super Nintendo uh, Land coming through. I mean, so so many interesting additions to the theme parks here in the States and around the world. Um, one, of the, one of the rides that Disney 
recently opened one of the attractions, and it looked incredible. I don't know if you've been able to go down there or not. I I, I know it's rather recent, so I'm I'm probably going to guess not. But that Avatar that they've opened, the Avatar Land in Disney, looks just incredible. Yeah, I, I've had coworkers who've gone down there for vacation with their family, and they said it was amazing. Um, especially the rides are good, but they've always told me the theming of that area to look like Pandora is amazing with the floating rocks and the, the light up uh, plants and whatnot, especially at night. And again, that goes back to talking about theming. You can have a great ride, but if the whole area is immersed into that universe, especially in the case of Avatar, it looks amazing. And it kind of seems to be the thing now that Disney is doing, which I applaud them, where it's you're taking something like Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, taking something like Toy Story Land, taking something like Pandora, and you're building a universe around those attractions. I just feel it, it, that more immersive experience, it, it just makes for an overall better time at a park. Yeah, and I... And that's kind of why I've always loved Disney. I've always felt like they've gone next level with the theming. Whenever I was a kid, when I went to Disney World, I was in the Animal Kingdom or if I was in the Magic Kingdom, wherever I was, it always felt like I wasn't in Florida. Like I was in an actual different part of the country uh, called Disney. Uh, it might as well have been its own state. It's so large, Disney World is. Um, but that that's kind of what's always attracted me. And I, I know spending – like the amount of money – that I'm sure Universal spent on Harry Potter and that they're spending on the on the Nintendo Land, that Disney is spending on Star Wars Land and, and Avatar and, and all that, it's got to be in the, if the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, probably more in the hundreds of millions of dollar range. And that's something I've always wondered. I've always wondered, because you were talking about the, uh, the mummy ride on your channel. I was watching that video last night. That's why it's fresh in my memory. And you were saying it was a $40 million ride to build um, in, in each of the parks. I think overseas, it was like a $20 million ride. Still mm -hmm. a whole bunch of money. I mean, that's a $100 million to build three rides there, three attractions. How, how do these parks go about? How does Universal and how does Disney go about allocating a budget to an attraction. I've never understood the model. You know, with with a movie, they can say, okay, we can spend $100 million on this Fast and Furious movie because we can, you know, gauge that X amount of people are going to go see it. We'll probably bring in X more. That makes sense to me. I understand that. But with a theme park, you're not paying to go on individual rides. You're paying one ticket and it's admission to all of these attractions. So how do you know how they come about budgeting for new attractions? As far as I've read, usually the main thing that they take away from trying to figure out the, what the budget is, is how many people they can actually get on the ride per hour. The reason behind that is basically if you can get a lot of people on a ride in an hour, that means you can have more people in the park. And it's more of an attendance draw itself. I uh, Usually when it comes to the budgets, you know, it, Disney and Universal – they don't usually make it announced. And usually what we are told is either from you know, secondhand sources or something that's been posted on a website. But what I've taken away is that usually they figure out, okay, if we have a ride that can seat eight people and we have 12 vehicles, that's 96 people every ride, four-minute ride, you know, we could fit maybe 1,300, 1,400 people in an hour. How many people can we actually get in the park at a time? Okay, so then we're going to focus and say this amount of money is going to work for that. But usually what happens is that most of the theme park rides in Disney were universal. They're never – it could be $40 million, They'll always go over budget. It's never, ever <laughs> whatever they say it is. You, Back to the Future in Hollywood is the best example. They were trying to open it at the same time as the Hollywood version on a $40 million budget. But because of foundation issues, they actually had to delay it two years and it cost them another $20 million. Oof. Yeah, so – you know, it's these things where you can have an idea, you can save $40 million, we'll work with what we can do, we'll see if we can find contractors that work within our budget. And, you know, in the case of Disney, there's always been, they've been very ambitious about their rides, but usually because of the budget, they usually cut stuff out where things don't make it to the cutting room floor. And, you know, sometimes that's a shame because there's some really good ideas behind it. But usually from what I've been told, it's how many people you can actually get on a ride per hour, and then they try to figure out from there what the budget should be. 
Well, that makes more sense. I've just never been able to figure out the ratio for it. And I, and I guess if you can get more people in, get more people out, that's a, that's a great thing for your park. You can attract more guests and, and, and keep them entertained for a longer amount of time. Now, throughout your journey over the last nine months uh, with Theme Park History, once again, go to that YouTube channel, Theme Park History. Hit subscribe. Support my man, Jack. He's also he's also a wrestling fan. We we talked for quite a bit about about some WWE uh, stuff before we rolled sound. But throughout your entire you know run with all these videos, all this research, what's been kind of the ride that you found had the most interesting history? It was probably the Jurassic Park ride because I never knew that production for the ride and planning started before the movie was actually even made. When they originally was going to create this attraction, it was going to be part of something that was from the book, where there's a part where some of the characters are going down the river and they keep coming face to face with, you know, the Tyrannosaurus Rex and our dinosaurs. So to me, it's it's always been weird that a, a a ride is not based on the movie; it's based off of something from the book. To me, uh, that's always been very interesting. Another thing that was interesting was the the Revenge of the Mummy ride. I've never had to wait too long, so I never knew what the backstory of the attraction was. So when I was actually doing my research to see what actually is taking place, I never knew that they were actually making another movie and that there's a curse and everybody's wearing these Medjai necklaces except Brendan Fraser. So it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes sense what, so it makes sense what happens to him at the end of the ride. I never understood why that was the case. So, But I, I always – it's probably Jurassic Park because I never knew – that once they signed the rights for the movie, they automatically started. Steven Spielberg said, "Hey, I want to make a I want to make a ride based on this part." And Universal's like, "Sure thing, Steven. Whatever you want to do, because you've been making us millions of dollars." It, it's always isn't it interesting how like Universal, they're like, "We're taking Spielberg," and Disney's like, "Then we take Lucas." It's all it's always a back and forth of those two companies. I mean, it it's so funny how they mirror each other all the all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that that's always been the one thing that, at least for Universal Studios Florida, they have an agreement with Steven Spielberg where he's a creative consultant for the attractions of movies he's been, you know, he's worked on. So when the park opened, that meant E.T., Back to the Future, and Jaws. Supposedly, according to something I read in the New York Post, he gets a two percent gross cut of all the ticket sales. Ooh, man, and, what a great a deal po- that is. It I, I I can't I can't I can't argue with you. So supposedly in that article, he's delayed his payments by ten years to, to extend his contract. So he's supposedly entitled anywhere between five hundred and thirty five million to, to close to a billion dollars, and that that is insane. The man could retire off of that if he wanted to right now. Holy it, it, crap. I had no idea about that. So no. so wait, when you say he's delayed his payments by 10 years, you mean what 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 do you mean exactly? His, so how his, does he how does that extend his contract? He he had a choice. I believe it was in uh, I'm trying to remember what year it was. I think his contract was supposed to be up somewhere around 2007 2008. Uh-huh. And he had the choice of not taking he can wait to take supposedly a one lump sum where he can just take you know annual payments. So he agreed that he'd stay on for another 10 years or something like that. And eventually when his contract does run out and he wants out, he's supposedly entitled to a one lump sum payment. So, And I've, I've been told too this is when Comcast took over and they started to own NBC and Universal, meaning the theme parks. They weren't doing so hot financially as a company, and they were kind of telling Steve, hey, listen, don't we don't take your money because we're going to really be in trouble if you start taking your money. So, But it also brings up a point that I don't think a lot of people bring up. The only existing attraction still at Universal Studios Florida he's responsible for is the E.T. Adventure, and supposedly he's very adamant about Universal closing it down. He won't let them do it. He supposedly, obviously, he says E.T. is his favorite movie, it's based off an imaginary character that he grew up with, and he feels you know a connection to that ride. I also think he doesn't want to give it up because if he doesn't have that ride there anymore, his contract's over and he can't make any more money. So his contract's void as soon as there are no more Steven Spielberg influenced attractions. I'm I'm going to go with the assumption and say yes because it's only for the Universal Studios Florida Park, as far as I'm as far as I know. I don't know if that includes Jurassic Park, but I. Obviously, they're changing over Jurassic Park to Jurassic World, 
So this might be a way for Comcast to try to get out of the contract. Again, this is just what I've read from things, and I've kind of just tried to put two and two together. Yeah. But, you know, it, if if this guy is owed as much money as he is, I won't be surprised if Comcast is like, let's try to just find a way out of the contract and move on because we're going to take a hit. Well, yeah, I mean, business-wise, it seems that Universal is always about their business, and that would probably be a good business move for Comcast. You know, you talk about Steven Spielberg and the Jurassic Park ride. One of the things that I always heard, and it was a rumor, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it, was that he loved the ride, he loved the attraction, but he would never go on the big drop. That he would stop before the big drop and he'd get off the ride. I don't know if you've ever found that out to be true or if you've ever heard that. I've only heard rumors of it. I've heard that he he's actually gone to the top and he's been asked to be let off numerous times so i don't know there's never been photos of him actually being wet getting off the ride so maybe it is true i've also heard rumors that on the opening day of universal studios florida when he was on the jaws ride with his family it actually broke down he was stuck on the ride for three hours so he never he never tends to have good luck on any of the rides he's involved in what was jaws one of the I guess one of the biggest blunders in theme park history. I would say so. I just, I don't know how you go through all of that work into the ride. You know, you have problems with the original version and you don't fix it. And three months into its run, you're shutting it down for good. And you have to spend two years to rebuild the ride brand new. It was to me, that entire first year for the park was such a disaster because none of their major attractions worked properly. They were constantly breaking down. They had to constantly tweak them. And then one of your major attractions closed three months into its run. And, you know, we talk about Back to the Future, how good of a ride is. If Back to the Future wasn't as successful as it was, you know, Universal Studios Florida might have been in a really bad spot. Back to the Future brought attendance levels up at that park. It it kind of rejuvenated interest into the park because everyone knew after that first year, none of those rides work. Why am I going to go back there? And then once word of mouth came out, hey, Back to the Future is a really good ride. It doesn't break down. You'll enjoy it. And people started to come back. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the history of that Jaws ride, even I think there was even a lawsuit. A guy fell in you know, to the water <laughs> when the Jaws shark attacked. And he was over by all the electronics. It could have been a really, really, really bad day at a theme park for him. The, the, the best part of that story, I think according to the lawsuit, is that when they pulled them back in, the people on the boat were clapping because they thought it was actually part of the attraction. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and you know what? I love it's, that. <laughs> it's, that's probably the best because you, you feel like, oh, man, I'm really part of this ride. This is really part. I'm like, I'm in the movie. It's like I'm riding the movie. Somebody is going to get eaten by the shark and we save them right now. So, so uh, yeah, that that, that would have that if true, uh, I love. That's why I love people. People always make me laugh. But you talk about you know these rumors or conspiracies. One one of the uh, rumors slash conspiracies I've always heard um, was about Disney, and that you know it, it, it was said that Walt Disney's remains were buried in the center of Pirates of the Caribbean because he died during the making of that attraction, and he had a great affinity for it filmed a you know wonderful world the disney special about the ride before its opening have you ever heard that do you, is there any validity to that i've heard that rumor but i don't it's usually is it's one of those urban legends you know it's right. it's it's something where i don't want to say yeah but that just doesn't sound like something <laughs> it doesn't sound again plausible he he, he, he he really did love the park so maybe there's a part of him Barry there? I, I I doubt it, though. I'm pretty sure somebody would have dug it up by now or they would have tried to look for it, whether it be employees or, you know, people visiting the park. I That's something I've heard, and I'm just like, I, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, and when you talk about Disney World, Disneyland, um, I always love about the kind of the the hidden parts of these parks, right? You know, in Main Street, USA and Disney, Walt's got an apartment above the firehouse or in the Matterhorn, there's the basketball court, um, which I've looked up trying to find pictures of and found some stuff. I don't know if it's real or not, but it looks like it's real. The, the basketball court and the Matterhorn. What, what are some of the like hidden secrets of these parks that you found like the most in, intriguing? Well, when you're talking about secrets and Easter eggs, some of the most interesting ones are actually they pay tribute to their former rides. 
So we didn't mention it in Revenge of the Mummy, but we did mention it in Confrontation. There's a tribute to Kong. There's a golden King Kong statue in the treasure room for Revenge of the Mummy. And it was, I think there's an E.T. statue as well for the Hollywood version, because obviously it replaced, uh, Revenge of the Mummy replaced E.T. Adventure in Hollywood. I've heard a bunch of other things too, but I think it's it's not really a secret, but there's a, for me, one of the best well-known secrets is that Islands of Adventure. There's a bridge, and there's a stairwell to go up and actually stand on the bridge, and you get a great view of the park itself. Now, in the last couple of years, actually, because they've had so many people going up there taking photos and whatnot, I think Universal actually locked that gate so you can't go up there anymore. Um, but, you know, other than that, it's just really, it's just for me, it's been Easter eggs here and there and trying to pay attention to certain things that you might have missed on your first ride and then realize on your second or your third or your fourth, depending on what ride it is. Yeah, yeah. And I always love, you know, going back and seeing, oh, man, I see the hidden Mickey there or I see this little Easter egg here or there. What do you think, though, as far as you talk about, you know, the E.T. ride, we talked a lot about the mummy ride, uh, surprisingly, but, you know, it, it, the mummy replaced E.T. What has been, you know, the Simpsons replaced Back to the Future? What has been like the weirdest replacement for a ride? I, I have a contender. I have, you know, the Twister ride was replaced by Jimmy Fallon raced through New York. Like what's been like the strangest replacement or revamp of a ride? Probably, I, I agree with you on Fallon, but I mean, I've always had this like, I won't say it's hatred, but I've always had a very dislike for Shrek 4D for replacing <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I actually enjoyed that attraction, and I, as I've gotten older and I've actually watched the movies, you have more of an appreciation for what Alfred Hitchcock did. So, you know, as a kid, not being able to experience it and for Shrek 4D to still be around, I mean, I think that attraction opened up in 2001. It's, it's way past its due, and yet it still stands there, usually just mocking people. So... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it. I think at that park, that attraction, it's people are. They always assume that's the next one to go. If an attraction's going to close down, it should be Shrek because its story takes place between the first and second movie, and that's like fifteen, sixteen years ago. Yeah, and it's like eight movies ago. <laughs> Pretty much <laughs> the franchise that just will not die. Um, no, don't. <laughs> but you know, I, I think the Jimmy Fallon one is interesting. I've always had an affinity for the Tonight Show, but when I heard Universal was opening up a Jimmy Fallon ride, um, talk me about, talk me through that one. Is, is that a popular attraction for a lot of people? I think a lot of people weren't happy with the choice of Jimmy Fallon. It's not that they don't like Jim, Jimmy Fallon. That's everybody's opinion. I've always been a Conan O'Brien guy, but I think it's just. It's like when we mentioned with Nintendo, it feels out of place and weird at the park. But honestly, it kind of seems more like a synergy move. Comcast owns NBC. They own Universal. They want to get everything in one park. They want to advertise. Here you go. You got your Tonight Show host and a ride. I, I always liked Twister. I've always been a fan of the movie. And the ride itself might get knocked for what it is, but I always thought it was a fun time. I knew the writing on the wall would be for it eventually, but I never imagined it being for Jimmy Fallon having his own ride that kind of just relates to all the gags and jokes he has on The Tonight Show. Just feels out of place. Yeah, it seems just like an, it's just a weird replacement. And speaking of theming of, of rides and, and IPs, you know, you, you have Jimmy Fallon, Shrek. What has been like some of the strangest, you know, IP tie ins in theme parks? I think from. What I've kind of looked at, Kings Island had a really a lot of really strange tie-ins. There was like a face-off tie-in and all kinds of weird stuff. What 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 about for you? What stands out? Well, well, the thing about face-off and whatnot, that's when Paramount actually bought Kings Island, and they wanted to make a Paramount action zone. So they made a Top Gun ride, a face-off ride, a Wayne's World ride. That's probably it. Wayne's World having its own roller coaster has always been the weirdest. I think it's called the Hurler. I, and it's just like a whole area is themed to Wayne World. Um, I'm trying to think right now what might be the weirdest like theming for like a coexisting. The I mean, Wayne's World's got to be up there. I did. I'd I, never heard of that one. Yeah, it's it's actually. I think is that the same. I think it is that a King's Island. Well, it was a King's Island. Um, I think late not not that I, I'm against it, but really people are not happy with the theming that it's going to be Guardians of the Galaxy showing up at Epcot. They don't oh, think it fits. Yeah. It does not fit what Epcot is. It's going into the Future Pavilion, 
which is supposed to be about like education and learning. And a lot of Disney fans are not happy. He's kind of getting the same backlash that Tower of Terror at Disney California's Adventure is getting. Yeah, because yeah. People, I, I, they, they've. I think we talked about it earlier in the podcast. They've, they've rethemed the whole ride, and now it's all Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, it's, it's part of a bigger plan. That whole area, they're closing down a Bug's Life, and they're going to make it some type of Marvel superhero land. So you're going to get a Spider-Man ride. You're going to get an Avengers ride. So for Disney, that is a big coup for them because they now are finally putting in stuff that's making them a lot of money at the movie theater. And they're now having a reason for people to come visit the parks. Not that they wouldn't already, but now you're going, you got a ride based on the Avengers? I'll go on that. I I literally would travel to California to go on that. So, yeah, and it makes but, sense. I mean, th- those properties are like the biggest properties in the world right now. That and Star Wars are making the most money, and they're both owned by Disney. So, <laughs> I mean, it makes yeah. sense for them to do it. But once again, like that when 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 I heard that because I was at Disneyland, I didn't get to ride Tower of Terror. Well, I was there, but I, I saw the Tower of Terror when I was at Disneyland over there in California Adventure, and I was like, oh, you could hear the, the blood-curdling screams coming out from the elevator shaft, and, and now to think that it's been replaced by the Guardians of the Galaxy, which I love the movie, don't get me wrong, but I just wish that, especially with all the real estate that you mentioned that Disney has, I just don't know why you go the revamp route with a classic attraction. Yeah, I agree with you on that, especially Tower of Terror, that... that- ride basically saved that park at a terrible opening they needed something to draw people into it and that's what the tower of terror did and to many that's the iconic attraction from that park so to change it over and put a marvel skin on top of it people call it what they see it they see it as a cash out they can see it as a reason for people to go to the park but you know what i will say again this is not from a fan this is from a business point if you got something that's making a lot of money somewhere why not get it somewhere else? Bring it to your parks. And again, the general audience isn't somebody like you or myself who follow theme parks. It's somebody who's curious. They're going to take their family on vacation. Why should I go to Disney California Adventure? Oh, they got a ride based on Guardians of the Galaxy? My kids love that movie. Let's go there. Yeah. No, that, you know, it makes sense. Now, are they going to retheme the ride uh, at Disney World? As far as I heard, no. And I, if they did okay, think well, anything good. like – if it did – they got any rumors of that, you know, people be there with pitchforks and knives ready to, <laughs> to stop them from doing it. Because the mo- most people at Disney Hollywood Studios, that is the attraction. That is the one that people say they should never replace it. And I agree with them. I've been on it. It's a fun experience. It's something different. It's based on a classic series being the Twilight Zone. And it kind of just fits into that entire area that they have for the park. So you're gonna, if you're going to replace that, you're most likely going to have to replace the entire area around it. And it just seems like a more of a headache, especially if it's not broke. Don't fix it. That's Absol- how I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a couple more questions before we wrap up here. But um, we, we're talking about the Tower of Terror, of, which, of course, had its own spinoff movie starring Kirsten Dunst uh, that was on the <laughs> Disney Channel. But what do you think has been the best? Because they've tried it a, a few times. There's been a few, mainly with Disney. I don't know if there's ever been a Universal. M- mainly it's a movie that gets turned into a ride with Universal. But at Disney, they've had several rides turned into films what do you think has been the best ride turned film that you've seen oh that's that's tough because i i'm trying to think off the top of my head which ones they've done haunted mansion i don't remember that being a good movie yeah it was eddie murphy i think raven simone Uh, yeah not 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 a quality film i remember watching a movie that was called tomorrowland from disney that had george clooney in it it wasn't bad but i I think Uh, the the standout for me would probably be pirates of the caribbean it it turned into a franchise a johnny depp nominated for an academy award for his performance from the first film yeah that's probably the most famously known one to be honest and you know that series is still going strong uh obviously with all the movies that keep coming out i probably would say that especially new pirates of the caribbean ride that is built over uh, in their other park, it just looks fantastic. And is this the one the in 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 uh, Shanghai? Yes, Shanghai. Shanghai is the one. That and ride I, looks incredible. They have one of the most brilliant effects I've ever seen. Uh, I've watched ride footage from that parts of the Caribbean ride, and it, there's a lot of you know kind of video walls and in 3D kind of 4D animation going on. But there's this beautiful effect that they do with 
uh, Jack Sparrow, he's on the Black Pearl, and then the Moonlight Shadow gets cast, and right in front of your face, this animatronic turns into a skeleton. And I, I cannot figure out how the Imagineers pulled that one off. It is, it is to me, the best effect they have done in like 10 to 15 years anywhere in any theme park, because you're right. I've watched the videos. I've tried to figure it out. I still can't. The only thing I can think of is maybe there's possibly some type of mirror effect, and that's why we're seeing it from one side to the other. But I agree with you where there's a, that transition from Johnny Depp being the pirate to actually going to skin and bones is so impressive. The, the entire ride is so impressive that it's something that I'm surprised that they haven't actually tried to bring it over here yet. But I'm pretty sure it's the same thing where if, if it's a classic attraction – they don't want to really change it because they know they'll really piss off the people that constantly come to the park. And you know what, though? Like, when you're talking about updating and revamping a ride, I think the way that they did Pirates of the Caribbean probably has been handled the best, right? Hey, Jack Sparrow, super iconic character that has been, that, you know, came out of this ride, essentially. You know, we made this ride into a movie. He was the main character, super popular character, nominated for an Oscar. How can we build in an animatronic into the ride? And, you know, let's have some Davy Jones in the ride. Let's replace some voices. Instead of a full facelift, they just, you know, tweaked a couple things. I think that's a nice way to do it without pissing off too many hardcore Mickey Mouse fans. Yeah, that's, I've, I've never had a problem with that. If you're going to add to the attraction a little bit here and there, that's fine. As long as you're keeping what the original attraction was. And that's kind of the thing where we keep talking about Jurassic Park, but this is what this transition to Jurassic World Everybody's really worried that the entire ride is going to change. It's going to be more of what the common universal rides are now, which is screens, simulators, 3D. From what I've heard, from what I've seen, it's still going to keep the original appeal of the Jurassic Park ride, but they're going to add new animatronics. They're going to add new effects. It's still going to be the same type of ride in spirit. You're just adding to update it. And the Pirates of the Caribbean is the best one. You're bringing in characters that people know. It's a beloved franchise. It's not hated by people. It does very well. So you're okay with the addition because it feels like, like you say, Captain Jack Sparrow, he's part of the Pirates of the Caribbean. He should be in the ride itself. Makes complete sense. Absolutely. So a couple last things here, Jack. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. Best attraction, worst attraction of all time in your opinion? No problem. Thank you for having me. Best attraction I have been on, I will defend it till the end of time, will be Jaws. I just, <laughs> I, 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 not, not the original version, the one that I experienced they, when yeah. it reopened. Well, the shark it's explodes. Pretty much. Right. Yeah, the, the explosion, the gas, the, the electric bite. To me, that, that ride as a kid, you're on the water, you're in a boat, you know it's not real, you know the water's like four feet deep, and you know that the sharks aren't real. But you always had this sense of, I always had this sense of thread that maybe the boat's going to sink. Maybe something is going to go right this time. And it just, it always felt like an experience in itself. Because literally, you're, you're on the water. You never know what's going to happen. Right. So I will defend Jaws to the end of time. Um, I don't know how many people feel that way. Usually, it's the, the other way. They go with Kong. The worst ride, it's probably Journey into Your Imagination. What is that? Talk- I've never even heard of that. So Journey into Imagination was an original Epcot ride where it's charming, it's fun, it's part of the Future World Pavilion, and it had two iconic characters. It has the, the Dream Finder, and it has Figment the Dragon. He's a beloved character in Disney, outside of obviously Mickey and everything. So it's considered a classic. It's considered one of the best rides Disney's ever created. So what Michael Eisner decided to do is we're going to update it, and we're going to remove everything that was good about the attraction. None of those characters... None of the charm, and it was universally hated by anybody who experienced the ride. It was so bad that a couple of years later, they had to go back and retweak the ride to include Figment again. But fans still say, you should have never touched it. You should have left it in its original form. That's going back to the discussion where we're like, you know, some rides do need to be updated and others don't. I always feel like Journey into Imagination is that ride that should have never been touched, and its replacement was terrible. Um, I haven't gone on it yet. I'll probably start bad mouthing it too. Is uh, the new ride at Universal Studios Florida is the Fast and Furious Supercharged ride. All I've heard from fans is that it's it's not worth the to replace Disaster or Earthquake. Um, they basically took whatever was on the tram tour. 
that part of it, and they basically just try to flesh it out into its full own ride, and it doesn't work. So, I don't know. I always stick with Journey into your imagination, though, because it's just it, you took it was a classic attraction, and Disney just really messed it up. You know, you talk about Jaws, you know, f- kind of frightening you when you were a kid. The the only ride, well, I say the only ride. I I've you know been in, in fright with a couple of drops on you know splash mount or what have you but the only ride that i've ever been truly terrified at and I, it's not there anymore i think it was replaced i think it was replaced by another property i can't think of off the top of my head but it was the alien escape at disney world i don't know if you oh, it, yeah you know about this ride i'm sure um I th- the, it the extraterrestrial alien encounter alien, it is, there we go yes yeah that ride is, as a child scared the ever-loving hell out of me well, you know what? That ride was ahead of its time. It's it you know like you have your you say you wish you went on back to the future. That's the one attraction I wish I got to experience because I've watched videos of it. I've watched other people cover it and it looks like such a badass ride for today. You know, to experience that would just be amazing. Obviously it was in the wrong park at the wrong time, but if Universal did something like that, I think it it would go over real well. It's one of those attractions that it's playing off your senses. You don't actually see the alien that much. It's the noises. It's what you're hearing to the left and right, the special effects. It was. It honestly looked like a really kick-ass ride. I would have wanted to go on it in a heartbeat. Yeah, well, you know, I remember, though, it frightened people. There was a woman. It's one of the one of the vivid memories that are burned in my mind from my time at Disney World as a young kid was there was this woman who, after the ride was over, I, I thought she was going to – they had to call paramedics over. She was breathing heavily, grasping her chest, and I'm like, man, that ride was crazy. I mean, definitely, if, if I didn't get to go on Back to the Future, I'm glad I got to – you, you can live vicariously through me, and as I do you, uh, on that ride. But, Jack, I appreciate you taking the time. Theme Park History, what's what's the future of the channel? What, what are you covering up next? What's coming up in the next few weeks? Well, we are focused. We just finished The Mummy, like you said. We I haven't made the announcement. I'll make the announcement here. I'll give you the inside scoop. The next video that's going to be coming out, it's been one that people have been asking for a while, and I'm finally getting around to it. We're going to cover Nickelodeon Studios. It's oh, for, 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 for anybody like myself who grew up in the 90s, you know that place was where you wanted to go. And obviously, a lot of people, I guess, my age want to see it, and I'm starting to get around to it. And then the plan after that is eventually I'm going to tackle another Disney classic, which is Horizons at Epcot, which some people say that's the best dark ride Disney's ever created. So to me, that's another ride I've never been able to go on, but I wish I did. So those are basically what we have planned down the line. And then obviously in October, I'm planning on doing a special video about Halloween Horror Nights and its history. Well, there's a lot of good stuff. And I, if you're a fan or even if, if you've never even thought about the th- history behind some of your favorite rides at these theme parks, definitely go check out Theme Park History on YouTube. It's a fantastic channel. I found myself binge watching several videos at a time. Uh, Jack does a great job of laying out all the content, all the history, everything you need to know. Uh, and follow him at, th- it's at Theme Park History on Twitter. It's at TPH YouTube. TPH YouTube. I'm sorry. Yeah. So at TPH YouTube on Twitter and make sure you go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Once again, over half a million views uh, in less than nine months. Incredible. Jack, I appreciate you taking the time, man. Thank you very much for having me. Love talking to you. Oh, Brad, what have you done now? Oh, Brad, what have you done now?